Power Fire, Ward in Earth, Hallowed be the name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever, forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. This is part two of the series titled The Kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus said this countless amount of times, right? In fact, some scholars said that he said that 126 times he talked about the kingdom of God. And so I hope you got something last week. And you know what? I was talking to a couple people last week about this and their feedback, uh, you know, came in this form. They said that, you know, that we, I said some harsh things, but they knew I said it in love. And I want to continue to have that, right? As your pastor, and if this is your first time uh, check tuning us in, whether you're watching us online or you're at one of our venues, just know that I deeply love seeing people grow all right so i don't i don't you know get pleasure from being harsh or challenging um actually i know the only reason i have to be challenging is because i want you to grow and ultimately i believe wholeheartedly you want to grow all right so let me take the gloves off for this season because not only that i'm getting challenged as well okay so i'm not excluding myself from that challenge but we want to grow together one of the things we want to grow in as a church is personal growth. And so I had to talk about what Jesus talked about, and he talked about the kingdom. And the craziest thing about the kingdom is that sometimes I feel like it's backwards. It is um, upside down. It is inside out. It is opposite day. All right. So if you're a parent, now my kids don't play opposite day anymore. Uh, but when my oldest, Chase, he's 16 years old right now, but when he was younger, he used to do this game called opposite day which would annoy the heck out of me because I would need him to say yes, throw out the trash, but he would jokingly say no, that he's not gonna throw out the trash. And then when I start getting inflamed and angry, he would say, but dad, hold on, it's opposite day. And it would annoy the heck out of me. So we made a rule, no more opposite day in the Rosado household, right? Because it's annoying. And I feel like I'm living a life full of opposite day. But when it comes to the kingdom, it is opposite day. All right, if you don't believe me, let's turn to scripture together in John 18, right? Jesus is talking to Pilate. This is uh, right before his crucifixion. And he says this, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now remember, we're talking about the kingdom. We're talking about the king having dominion, king dominion, king dumb. It's his realm and it's his reign. It's his dwelling and it's his domain. That's what we're talking about in regards to the kingdom. So Pilate, a person of authority, asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this on your own accord or do others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me, right? So they brought Jesus on this account that he was preaching blasphemy, that he was the son of God. And so the Jews turned him over to Pilate at this time. And Jesus answered, and watch this, highlight this today. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might be not delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. So then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. If you're talking about a kingdom, Jesus, that means you are a king. Jesus answered and said this, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I came into this world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate finalized this whole thing and said to him, what is truth? And that closes the dialogue between him and Pilate, because right after this, Pilate then just sends him outside and says, I find no guilt in him. But what is truth today? 
Um, the only way we're going to find truth is to live under the authority of God, the author of truth. And we're going to move forward today by um, building on what we talked about last week. One of the framing phrases that I said last week was that the kingdom of God should be our reality. And today I want to add a layer to that and say that the kingdom of God is not natural. So the kingdom of God should be our reality and the kingdom of God is not natural. It's opposite day. The way up is down. You want to be the greatest? You must be the last. You want to be the first? You must get to the end of the line. You, you want heaven? You have to go through hell. You want pleasure? You got to go through pain. It's inside out. It's upside down. It's not of this world. It is not natural. Wherever you are right now, say to the person next to you, it's not natural. Right now. And I, and I, and I have a gut feeling that has Voorhees, because Voorhees, there's a lot of strong characters there. You didn't do it. You didn't do it. So right now, look to the person, stare, stare into their eyeballs, make it awkward, and say, this is not natural. If you're in the comments right now, say, this is not natural. The kingdom of God, Jesus said very clearly, my kingdom is not of this world. So the kingdom of God is not natural. And he continues on with this theme in regards to the kingdom throughout his whole entire preaching. In fact, one of the times we see him preaching in Matthew 5, you know, we call this the Beatitudes, but, but Jesus seeing the crowds, starting in verse 1, he's seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and, he, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. This is what he's taught them. He taught them this. Blessed are those who pour in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poverty, poor in spirit. I love it that he did not say poor in pocket. He said poor in spirit. That's a whole other sermon. But he said poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's this kingdom talk again. But you, we, don't, we don't naturally or logically put together royalty and poverty in the same phrase. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, right? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called son of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs again is the kingdom of heaven. Pain, blessed are those who are going through pain, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's this upside down, inside out kingdom that he continually keeps on pushing and teaching to those who follow him. Because why? His kingdom is not of this world. It is not natural. So we have to get this into our reality. So if last week we talked about the kingdom of God should be our reality, our reality should recognize and lean into the fact that this is not going to come natural to us. We have to learn this together. We have to grow in this together. We cannot just listen to the voice of religion. We need to listen to the voice of Jesus. Come on, somebody, I'm preaching. All right. We need to listen not to the voice of religion, but to the voice of Jesus. What is Jesus telling us? Right. So throwing a lot of scripture here because I want to make sure that what I'm talking today is not my opinion. And it should challenge all of us because it's coming straight from the sacred scripture. Right. So Luke 18, Jesus tells us this parable and he says this. He goes, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Ooh. Do you trust in yourself today? I know there are moments in my life where I have a deep rooted trust in myself that I trust myself more than I trust anyone else. I trust myself more than God. So this parable is applicable to us, okay? Who trusted himself that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray, right? So temple, that was their version of church back then, right? So imagine two people went to church to pray. One, a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is a person who's been highly educated um, in, in, the, in the Jewish mindset. 
and highly educated in the law, very religious, okay? And so that's what this Pharisee is. So a Pharisee and the other, a tax collector. A tax collector is a sinner, a person who's betrayed his people, who's working for the government, taking money from his own people. So he's a backstabber, he's a cheater, he's a sinner. I wanna create this contrast for you. So you have the person who's uber religious and the person who's a sinner, right? The Pharisee, watch this, standing by himself. Now this is a, this is a, a picture that Jesus is painting with his words through this parable. And he says, the Pharisee is standing by himself and this is what he prayed, all right? We get, a little, we get a little ear into his prayer life and he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Now I know you think, oh, I would never, I would never pray something like that. Um, if I'm honest though, sometimes my prayers lack compassion and I go, well, God, thank you that I'm not in this person's situation or thank you, Lord, that I'm not struggling in that way, right? So, so, so our prayers might not sound exactly like that, but maybe they have the heartbeat, the spirit of what this guy is saying. So thank you that I'm not like this other men, extortioner, unjust, adulterers. How much of our prayers are saturated in comparison even? Prayers that are saturated in comparison have a deeply rooted religious spirit in them. I'm creating space and silence there for you to at least go, mm, mm, and recognize that um, in yourself. Don't, 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 even not right now, they're like, oh man, so-and-so needs to hear this. No, you need to hear it, okay? So he says, the unjust adulterers are even like this tax collector. I fast, and this, I love this, when you start, you start giving, giving God your resume, right? I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. You know, sometimes I, I do that in my injustice prayers. Like, come on, God, I'm serving you and, I'm, and I'm, I'm here every single week. I'm the first in and the last now. God, can you please hook me up? And I know that's not the posture of the Pharisee in this, but there's still moments in my life where I just like declare my resume to God. At, number one, as if he doesn't know. Number two, as if that's gonna move him. I, I'm not asking, I'm not showing God these things because like I'm doing it because of his love. I'm showing this because I'm trying to, to gain more of his favor when I already have his favor, right? And so there are times when we do this stuff, we all, we do this and let's admit it. We're gonna to grow together, let's admit it. We all do this stuff, right? So he says, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all I get. But, so then Jesus says, okay, that's the Pharisee. Here's the tax collector, right? But the tax collector standing far off, okay? So the Pharisee was standing by himself. There's a difference here. He was standing by himself. And then the tax collector was standing afar off. Why? Because he didn't feel like he fit in. He felt like maybe right now today, I just want to talk to you right now that Jesus loves those who don't feel like they fit in. And I want to tell you as your pastor, I empathize with that. You know, growing up, uh, there were times where I was, uh, was too white to be Puerto Rican or too Puerto Rican to be white, or um, I wasn't minority enough for the minorities and, 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 and I wasn't, you know, rich enough to be with the rich people. I, I was just always constantly in the middle, never felt like I fit in. So I empathize with you. And this is what this tax collector, he's in this temple. He doesn't feel like he fits in. So he's standing afar off and will not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this is Jesus talking now, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. That means made right. That means in right standing with God rather than the other. For listen to this, this is this upside down, inside out kingdom. Jesus said this, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Up is down, down is up when it comes to the kingdom of God. So that's why, folks, that this goes against our nature. That's why there's sometimes, and, and um, um, let me get a big amen on this. Are there times when um, you, do the ro you do the right thing, but have the wrong emotions? Can I get an amen? I, I did the right thing. Oh, I, 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 I got this big check. And I tithe and, and, and oh, that, that didn't feel good, but, 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 but I did it anyway. There are times we do the, 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 the right thing and get the wrong feelings. Or even opposite, there are times we do the wrong thing and get the right feelings. Or what we think are the right feelings. Come on, right? This inside out 
upside down kingdom of God. We, 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 that's, what we're, that's what's supposed to be our reality, but let's lean into the fact that it is not natural. And I don't want to be the super Christian to tell you, well, it's easy, just, just be obedient. Just, just like that, just like that. No, it is not that easy. And we're all gonna wrestle and we're all gonna struggle with it. Can I get an amen? Come on, in the chat, in Sewell, in Voorhees. Can I get an amen? All right, so this is something we're going to struggle with. So is your life based on the natural or is it based on the supernatural? That's an important question for all of us to answer today. Is it based on the natural or is it based on the supernatural? If I am declaring myself to be a Christian, a believer, a follower of Jesus, then it has to be based on the supernatural, right? But instead, how many of us are Christian atheists where functionally we say we believe in Jesus, but our functions and our habits and our thoughts and our actions are all natural. We, we live like atheists, but believe like Christians, right? Um, and listen, we all do that, including myself, we all do that. So no condemnation here, but we all are going to grow together. But, but let's quantify that. Let's answer that together. How much of our life is natural and how much of our life is based on the supernatural. Now, I know we live in the natural world. Jesus said that uh, my kingdom is not of this world, but he was in the world, okay? So we have to face some world realities, but I'm talking about the way we function and process the world. Do we function and process it in a natural way, or do we see it through the eyes of the supernatural? Um, and, and if we're not, could that be the very reason of why we're not growing, right? because at the end of the day, our faith is supposed to grow. But instead, we're growing the facts, we're growing information in our lives, we're growing logically, um, but are we growing spiritually? Uh, maybe it's because we're looking through the, eye, the lens of the natural rather than the lens of the supernatural. Again, I'm talking about the kingdom of God. You might feel like a loser naturally, you might feel like you're not enough naturally, and maybe that is true. But the hope that we have in Jesus is that he's enthroned in the heavenly realms. So in the supernatural, I am winning, even though in the natural, I might be losing. Why? Because the way up is down, the way in is out, this is the kingdom of God. Y'all getting this? This should be encouraging. If it's not at least challenging, it should be encouraging that the stuff that we're facing in this world, the pandemic, you know, the stuff that we're facing in the political realm, the stuff that we're facing in our marriages and in our families, that that might be happening naturally, but supernaturally, we can still have victory. Supernaturally, I'm still on the winning team. So we have to tap into what does it mean for not the kingdom of God, not just to be our reality, but also to know that it goes against my nature. And so I might not feel the right feelings, but I'm not worried about that being of this world because his kingdom is not of this world. All right, so here's a couple questions, actually two questions that we're gonna process together um, and grow together in regards to the kingdom of God not being natural, okay? Here's the first one, do we, trust ourselves more than we trust God. You might think that that is a silly question to ask, but I think it's a question that we need to ask on a moment to moment basis. Because I have learned throughout my Christian walk, I'm not talking pre-Jesus, I'm talking post-Jesus. I've learned post-Jesus to compartmentalize my trust in God. God, I trust you here. I trust you here, not so much there, not so much there. Oh, but I definitely trust you here. I've learned to compartmentalize trust and I've had to come to the realization that if I don't trust him in all things, then I trust him in no things, okay? Because God is not a person, right? So, so I could trust, you know, I could trust my accountant with my money, uh, but I'm not gonna trust him with my wife, hello. Right. I'm not I, I could compartmentalize trust in regards to people. But if God is who he says he is, if he is omniscient, omnipotent, all knowing, all powerful, everywhere at all time, he's omnipresent. If he's all that in a bag of chips, then if he's all things, then I need to trust him in all things. Let me say that again. If he is all things, then I need to trust him in all things. 
So from moment to moment, we got to ask ourselves, do I trust myself more than I trust God? He told this parable in Luke 18. He told this parable to those who trusted in themselves. So some of you might think, no, I trust the Lord. Okay, let's get deeper. Let's get deeper. This is a sub, sub question under that question. We're not at the second question yet. Sub question under that question. You ready for this one? And take your time to answer this. Is that, is your obedience attached to your logic? Is your obedience attached to your logic? Do you ask why and how before you ask who? <laughs> Do you ask why and how before you ask who? What I mean by that is like, well, okay, God, God, you're asking me to do something. I feel like the Lord's leading me to do something. You ask why and how rather than who. Who is telling me this? If it's God that's telling me this and we live in the reality of this kingdom and I'm asking him to grow me supernaturally, why the heck is my obedience attached to things that are natural, like my logic. So when I'm asking why and how, I could care less about the who, right? And so, but what would happen if, we're, who's telling me this? God's telling me this. Well, it doesn't really matter why and how then, right? If we truly believe in God, if he's truly all authority in our lives, then why the heck do we start with why and how? It should start with the who. Because if we sit there and say, well, who told me this? Well, okay, well, if my parents told me this, okay, then, let, then let's talk about the why and the how. Or if, if, if my boss told me this, okay, then let's talk about my why and the how. But if God told you this, if God has said, has said something to do in Scripture for you to do, um, man, is your obedience attached to your logic? Oh, we're going to grow. We're going to grow. I'm like, man, I don't like these questions. Neither do I. But we are going to grow. OK. And so our logic is very linear in our thinking. Right. It, it, linear in natural thinking. So we say things like if I do this, then God does that. OK. And that's what religion has taught us. Religion says God responds to us. That's what religion says. God responds to us. That's why this Pharisee was giving him God his resume. Right. This is what I do. If, if God responds to us. No, 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 no. If it starts with the who, we respond to God. God does not respond to us. That's, that's, that's the way our logic has distorted our faith a little bit. That if I do this, then he does that. No, he has done everything for me. So I, it's my job. We are ultimately, ultimately the, the purpose of the church is worship. We're responding to God and who he is and what he doesn't have to do a single thing else in our lives to deserve our worship. OK, so my my obedience should not be attached to my logic. And that's where we have to safeguard ourselves from religion, because religion removes the supernatural in our interaction with God. Let me say that again, because it's so important. Religion removes the supernatural in our interaction with God, okay? F the, the crazy part is that the Pharisees have a whole entire history of God moving supernaturally, right? Parting the Red Sea, right? Uh, providing manna from heaven, providing bread from heaven. You know, God constantly provided for the Jewish people of the time. They have a deep-rooted history of God moving supernatural, but somehow, someway, humans have always a tendency to force things back into a natural box, even though God wants to grow us supernaturally. And, 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 and I want to remind us of this important point. You cannot desire the supernatural. You cannot desire the supernatural and require the super logical at the same time. Let me say that again. You cannot desire the supernatural and require the super logical at the same time. And then here's what happens, right? I'm dropping bars right now. When you when you desire the supernatural, but require the super logical, you become super mechanical in your faith. And then we wonder, why, why, don't I, why don't I feel fresh 
in my faith? Why don't I feel like I'm going anywhere? Because you stuck on the hamster wheel. You stuck on the treadmill. You become super mechanical with God because you cannot, you cannot desire the supernatural and but require the super logical at the same time. We want God to answer the who, I mean, we want God to answer the why and the how, but we need to start with the who. Do you trust yourself more than you trust God? But I get it. I do get it. Um, I heard a preacher talk about it earlier this week, um, that it's difficult now more than ever to um, lean into the who, that who that is omniscient, that who that is all-knowing. It's difficult to lean into him um, because it, it feels like we get this false sense of omniscience in our pocket, this thing. We get a false sense of omniscience. We, anything we want to know, we, we, we could just Google it. Boom, Google it. Got it. All right. And we walk around feeling like we know a lot of things. Um, and that's it. Hasn't that been evident even in uh, during this pandemic? Right. You you skim read a couple articles from whatever tribe you belong to. Right. Whatever political side you belong to. You skim read a couple articles. And um, the sad part is, like, I feel I believe wholeheartedly that journalism is dead. Um, they're not giving you journalism used to just give you facts and then you create the narrative. Uh, based on your worldview in regards to those facts. But now they're not, they're not giving you facts. They're giving you their commentary and opinions. And they're giving the commentary and opinion that is appealing to the tribe um, that they want to target, right? And so it's hard for us to grow and learn when we're only listening to the books that are written by our tribe, right? And then what we do is we demonize any other tribe outside of our tribe and we don't learn and just listen. OK, especially whether it be pro mask, anti mask or blue lives matter, or black lives matter. It's like you name it, whatever tribe you belong to, you automatically demonize the other side. Right. Um, and and I don't believe that that is the kingdom way. Um, it's just not it, our, our job is to sit there and listen and to be peace. Blessed are the peace makers. OK, and so we want to live kingdom people. But it's hard when we feel so authorized by information. OK. Now, again, I'm not advocating for any side. Don't hear that. Don't twist this message to say that. What I am saying is that no wonder why it leads us to the state of trusting ourselves and the information that we read more than God himself. Because there's a sense of entitlement because of the information that we get. And again, let me ask you the question. Do you trust yourself more than you trust God? Do you trust yourself more than you trust God? Because remember, the kingdom of God is not natural. It's natural to trust yourself. It's natural to trust what you can see, what you can taste, what you can feel more than a God that you can't see, that sometimes you can't feel, that sometimes you can't hear, right? Like everyone, we always want to talk about hearing God. And I know at the end of the day, we hear God's voice through his scripture. But there are moments where many of us, many of us, we do not hear the audible voice of God. And it goes against everything naturally inside of us. Number one, can we make that normal for a second? Right? There's times where like, you, a lot of people walk around saying, I heard God, I heard God. No, you didn't. Like, maybe you got this unction, this thing inside of you that's leaning towards that way. And yes, that, that is the Holy Spirit, um, but, but just let's just call it what it is. That's not natural. It's not. And let's not pretend that people outside of the church need to see that as normal, <laughs> right? Like, it's not natural, but it happens. Why? Because it exists in the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is supernatural. So we can't sit here walking around saying that we heard from God but still require all the logical things to line up in order for me to be obedient, okay? Can't have it both ways. You, again, you cannot desire the supernatural and require the super logical because you'll end up super mechanical and not growing. So do you trust yourself more than you trust God? Here's a second question, and this one, you're, you're gonna wanna throw something at the screen right now. Um, 
because this should be a duh question, but are you humble? Are you humble? He's talking about those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now here's the test. If you answered yes to that question, um, you're automatically not humble. <laughs> right? If you answered yes, you're automatically not humble. All right. So are you humble? This man, the Pharisee, we're going back to the Pharisee here in Luke 18. This man was number one, praying with one eye open, right? He was sitting there, God, thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. Um, obviously, Jesus was making this distinction that there was the, this person lacked the humility um, to be a part of the kingdom of God. And so I want to talk to some of the Christians here, especially those who, who've been around the block for a really long time. Um, have you stopped seeing yourself in other sinners? Do you get angry more than you get compassionate when you see people struggling in their lives? Can I tell you that that is not the kingdom of God? And especially nowadays, folks, we live in cancel culture, okay? We cancel people very quickly. And I think that the reason that we cancel people so quickly is because we stop seeing ourselves in the center. We stop being humble. We're real quick to cancel people. Now, I'm all about canceling things. Yeah, let's cancel sexual abuse. Let's, let's cancel spiritual abuse. Let's cancel, you know, um, treating people in, 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 like they're less than us. Let's cancel that. Let's cancel division. Let's cancel all that other stuff. I'm down to cancel things. Like, I, I believe I could back it up scripturally to cancel things. But to cancel people, that is not kingdom culture at all. And let me challenge us that here at Fervent Church, um, that's why I don't like saying the word multicultural. We are a diverse church. We're not multicultural. We're multi-ethnic, but we're not multicultural. We have one culture here, and that's a kingdom culture. Can I get an amen in the chat? Can I get an amen in Seoul? Can I get an amen in Voorhees? Can I get an amen all across the World Wide Web that we're about kingdom culture? We're not about cancel culture. We're not multicultural. We might have multi multiple ethnicities, and that's a beautiful thing. And we might be multi-generational. That's a beautiful thing. But multicultural, we have one culture here that honors other people's ethnic cultures, but we have one culture here, and that is a kingdom culture. Why? Because we are not of this world. We're not of this world. So fine, you know, you came from, I know me being Hispanic and growing up in, in the urban Hispanic arenas, you know, we, we, we treated women like they were less than, we were womanizers, we, we, were, we were people that were just quite gross, if I'm really honest with you. That's, and well, that's just typical Spanish culture. They're very sexual, they're very this, they're that. Forget about my, before I'm a Puerto Rican, I'm a, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Before I'm an American, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Before, you know, before, you know, I don't fall on one political side or not, but before you're a Republican, you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Before you're a Democrat, you're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever tribe you've attached yourself to, before any of that, we're a part of the kingdom of heaven. That's how we're supposed to function. And the kingdom of heaven asks us to be humble and to see ourselves in people who are different to see ourselves in people who we consider are sinners. Because that's what the Pharisee missed out. The Pharisee missed out on receiving the grace of God, right? The Bible says that Jesus, when he was telling this parable, he said that that man, that tax collector, went home justified. Another way to say that, he went home changed. Maybe another reason why some of us aren't growing spiritually is because we lack humility. We desire so much to be the teacher. We desire so much to be the expert that we forgot to maintain this posture of a student. You're not humble. Do you see yourself in other people? And you sit there, and, and I've even said this, I caught myself that, like, oh, I, 
I don't judge people. I don't judge people. I'm, I might not judge people. I might not label them, but I sure do sentence people. Right? Don't you sentence people? Don't you like, especially like for me, like one of my triggers is injustice, right? When someone, when I feel like, oh, you know, I watched this pastor fall from grace and, and uh, which is a stupid statement, fall from grace, right? I watched the pastor, you know, fall morally and, and you know, a few years later, he's back in the pulpit, right? And it's real easy for the Christian world to judge that pastor and be like, well, no, he doesn't deserve this. And how long, how long should the sentence be? I'm not judging him, but, 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 but we are determining the sentence sometimes for certain people. Come on, take the gavel out of your hand and be humble and see yourself, see yourself in the center. That's what changed that tax collector. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. It's upside down, it's inside out, it's last and first. It's the kingdom of God. It is not natural. And thank God it's not natural because that means it's challenging. That means it's painful. And whenever challenge and pain are involved, those are beautiful opportunities to grow. So let's grow, church. Let's grow. Let's believe that there is this kingdom of heaven that we're all invited to be a part of. And it goes against our nature, but thank God because it forces us to grow together. And that can be a powerful thing. Let me pray for you. Father, I praise you for your kingdom. Your kingdom is amazing. Your kingdom is inside of us. So have your rule, have your reign in every department in our life. If we're struggling. If we have done like what I did and compartmentalized trust, help us, Holy Spirit, to help you tr to trust you in all things. I trust you in my health. I trust you in my finances. I trust you in my marriage, in my family, in my business. Help us learn to trust you, Jesus. In fact, together in the chat, in Sewell, in Voorhees, say together, even if you don't fully mean it, let's proclaim it until it's ours. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus.